You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or a contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for April 19th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where, as we prepped for this week's podcast, we asked ourselves... Oh, Lord! Do we have the strength to carry on this mighty task in one night? Or are we just jerking off? It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. a power outage at our place and the fridge went on the fritz and i don't know what we're going to stretch those two events into an hour-long podcast <laughs> we do but not our... need a new refrigerator that is the no, best no, no. news of the week is that no. they I... need to order a part we're temporarily he he jerry-rigged our fridge so that it we will did. hold our food cold for a few days needs a defrosting something or other in it put in there thingamajig and and very much like Twitter, uh, I stood behind him and offered helpful suggestions, which he ignored. So, <laughs> yeah, the repair guy was a nice guy, you know. Yeah, what I yeah. love is they come into our house and they put like um foot protector things little over booties, their yeah, boots so on. that they won't yeah. get our my house dirtier than it already is. Middle child cleaned up the living room, they're off school because it's Good Friday, and yeah. uh, boy, she did such a good job. And I'm just delaying the inevitable that we're going to have to talk about the Mueller report. It's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's a fire hose. It's an yeah, absolute it fire hose of, uh, you know, information and uh, stuff we already knew was true. But yeah, I think the thing that I take away from it is, first of all, how cinematic this narrative is and true. that there, true, true. It, there are so many moments in it. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read the highlights and the... And not just on Twitter, but, you know, actually read articles where they're putting together, here's, you know, he said, I don't remember or I can't recall 37 times in his paper interview. And he, uh, his family members are all over it. And, uh, and, and really, if you're looking for a smoking gun, there is one, which is Don Jr. did brief Donald Trump on the fact there was a meeting coming up yes. where he was going to get dirt on Hillary Clinton. So he knew, he knew this was going to oh, happen. This- there's a, there's an awful lot of that in there. I mean, this yeah. it really is a a damning, a massive and damning report right. on, on every level. And uh, the only reason that Donald Trump hasn't been marched out of the White House in cuffs, uh, where he would make bail because Deutsche Bank would put up you know yeah. whatever his bail needed to be, um, is because of a rule that the Justice Department has that you can't that 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 Bob Mueller has interpreted to mean presidents can't break the law. Right, can't, can't be, be indicted. indicted. They, right, can break can't the law. Indicted. They just there's a rule because you don't want a president trying to govern from prison. Right, because um, that would be embarrassing. So, but that's the only reason. There are. This is. Uh, I think it was Jonathan Alter said um, something to the effect that this is not uh, one or two things. This was an artillery barrage of yeah of crimes and impeachable offenses that were just there. I mean, it's all on the page, and of course, the advantage that you have on Fox news or hate radio on the right is that no one's going to read this, right? No one's going to read the fucking report. They're going to read the digested uh, lies that uh, uh, the entire Fox news team are going to chew up and spit out for the little baby. Whatever Brit Hume decides to say about it is what they're going to believe. And And for the, the same people who believed in death panels and that Barack Obama exactly. was a Kenyan Separate are going to believe that. And baby parts and yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, we're going to talk about that. Uh, but since we can't possibly add to the uh, legal expertise that's already available, all you have to do is stick your head out the window. and You'll yeah. hear four lawyers <laughs> talking about parsing the legalities of this. Our job, as we try to make sure you realize every week, we've, we view our job. Uh, as giving you perspective and and context and vocabulary, voca- vocabulary to right. understand what's happening to you, what's happening to all of us, how to navigate it, what the stakes are, and just a, a guide to getting you through the insanity that are these powerless modern times. And the other takeaway from this for me is that Donald Trump has now lost the narrative. 
Yes. Uh, yep. Apart from Fox News, where the narrative has always been uh, scripted and fake and propaganda, uh, he has lost the narrative in the Beltway to say anything that anyone is going to believe. His spokesperson has been utterly discredited uh, in the Which face one? of oh, the, that's right. All of them. Of yeah. the feckless <laughs> White yeah. House press corps. Uh, I mm-hmm. think you said last night before I conked out, you said, yeah. you know, <clears throat> the evidence was so damning that even the White House press corps sat up and noticed. And yeah. this, uh, I, which tip Monty Python. Yeah. But yeah that's yeah. exactly it. It's like, oh, it's that it's bad. It's that it's, bad. It's that so actually, bad. Actually, uh, you know, the lapdog press has to say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, and yes. and. Now, April Ryan, who has always been courageous, said, look, it's yes. time for her to go. You know, Huckabee yeah. Sanders has to go. Uh, but the rest of them, you know, sitting there waiting to go, oh, look, I get to ask a question today. Like, that's a mm-hmm. thing. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, now, be, it's beyond the pale. Their behavior is beyond the pale. And the response was, of course, Sarah Sanders lied about lying. Yes, with Hannity, uh, with Hannity, yeah. who, who made just, excuses just, for her. Yeah, Because the only place she's ever actually under oath, I don't know if she has to swear an oath to the Constitution. I, I don't I assume think so, she no, does. No. I assume everyone does. I don't know. But uh, the only place she actually had to put her hand on a Bible, which is probably the first goddamn time in her life she's touched a real Bible, <laughs> not daddy's made up <laughs> fake Bible, uh, was when she was faced with actual consequences, right. actual real throw your ass in jail, fine you consequences for lying and then she had to admit that she made shit up on the podium right. uh to cover her ass too and it wasn't just about the weather it was about jim comey yeah yeah and jim comey being an embarrassing humiliating person that she served for many 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 fbi agents is awful and a disgrace all of which she just lied yeah. about and then she lied about lying about it because that's what you do when you're on fox um if you'd like to l- look at the arc of the narrative failing uh, because I don't think I, I don't think he's lost the narrative. I think now there's a mad scramble for the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't they don't know what to do on Fox other than other than do exactly what they've always done louder. They're still going to celebrate. It's still going to be you know a, 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 a party at the White House. It's still going to be a beer bust in the Rose Garden. A complete exoneration. Everything's over, etc. Um, but I went today, Blue Gal. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I've written like 90 posts in the last two days. Uh-huh. I've, been, <laughs> I've been busy. They've been small, but they've been effective. Um, I broke the Beltway Iron Rule of David Brooks uh, by going back a month and reading David Brooks's column from less than a month ago, where he pronounced from his high and mighty post of the New York Times that we've all made fool of our, fools of ourselves again. Maybe it's time to declare a national Sabbath. Maybe it's time to step back from the scandal mongering and assess who we are right now. Then he goes through and says, Democrats should be humble and self, self-reflect. they made grievous accusations. Beto O'Rourke and John Brennan owe Donald Trump a public apology. Blah, blah, blah. And the sad fact is that since Watergate, everybody uses scandals, even if they're not really scandals, to try to destroy their opposition. One month later. Wow. The Mueller report is like a legal version of a thriller movie in which three malevolent forces are attacking the city all at once. Uh, by the way, David Brooks is a terrible writer. I don't know who got the impression that he wasn't, but literally less than a month later, he has completely reversed himself and is now wringing his hands over the fact that Donald Trump and Julian Assange and Vladimir Putin are all simultaneously attacking his beloved institutions. And what's hilarious about that is, uh, first, it is hilarious to see David Brooks, uh, who has spent the last 15 years poisoning our public dialogue with bullshit bosiderism declaring that it's a horrible thing that everyone else is po- poisoning our public dialogue like julian assange and donald trump and second uh any reader will notice that at no point when he's telling this tale of three evil wizards does he mention conservatism or the republican mm-hmm. party or fox mm-hmm. news or hate radio or history in any he way is, he is he just, utterly too- blind to all of that oh he's not blind he's just a he, fucking he liar is- <laughs> But he's, well, I mean, his persona, he, a, I don't mean that he's willfully oh, yeah. blind. I mean, he, no, no, he really he pretends just, that he knows nothing about Rush Limbaugh or, or his audience he, at all. Right. He lives in the eternal um, stunned now. The past never happened. The future is a mystery. Uh, and there he is all week long on every show you can imagine. He's going to CBS and NPR and, and Today Show and uh, promoting his stupid yeah. book. I still have to find out if there's learns... a quiz in the back of it, like there was one of his last books. 
Well, I'll give you the short and dirty on it. It's uh, how he learned spiritual excellence by dumping his first wife and marrying his young <laughs> research assistant. And I call it the second mounting, although the actual title is the second mountain because I'm a dirty old person and I, I, <laughs> I never, never try to miss a chance. But, but the point of this is that's the arc of the narrative. A month ago, the, the absolute pinnacle of respectable insider beltway talkers, David fucking Brooks, declared that Democrats should apologize and abase themselves for making such scurrilous accusations. Less than a month later, it's like, oh, my God, Donald Trump's a monster. He's wrecking our institutions. There may not be collusion, but holy shit, things mm-hmm. are really bad. And there's no acknowledgement anywhere that he ever wrote anything other than this. It just appears out of a clear blue sky. The only person who mentioned this, I believe, uh, was one of the guys from the uh, 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 Pod Save America group. Yeah. I told him to stay the fuck off my corner because <laughs> are they writing about David no, Brooks? <laughs> no, it, listen, here's the here's the deal. You gotta pay ten grain five dollars to write about Peggy Noonan. You gotta pay me five dollars to write about David Brooks. I'll let you use dumpster fire for free. <laughs> but but getting back to the narrative issue, that's what we really want to talk about is how drastically uh the narrative has shifted and how important it is to craft narratives in the right way craft stories in the right way well yeah we're crafting stories because that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. particularly how democrats craft their stories yes, um there have been a couple of articles uh this week that have piqued our interest yes one is by david leanhart is that right yeah david leanhart in the new york, in the new york times. times uh who who made two really important points his, his <laughs> the opinion piece i thought was a stupid title i'm sure he didn't write the title because i think it's It really isn't what the article is about. No. The GOP promotes leftism. Whatever the hell that is. This makes no sense, this title. It's clickbait. It's clickbait. The the subtitle is, if centrist policies are doomed, why should Democrats pursue them? And And that is mm -hmm. the point of the article. And it's, I think, really good. He, He makes two points. One is... Republicans are absolutely not interested in market-based solutions to problems. Right. They're not interested in cap and trade. They're not interested in anything that where government has a role in fixing a problem. Right. They're interested in opposing Democrats and gaining power. They, they hate government. Right. And they refuse to uh, – because to – to get on board with a, a half-assed idea like cap and trade, right, which you is have to believe that right. climate change is a problem. Right. And they simply don't. They will not acknowledge that it's a problem. To get on board with income redistribution of any kind, you know, making sure that there's not a, a grotesque disparity between the very, very rich and everyone else, especially the poor, you have to believe that that's a problem. If, if To get on board with the idea of Obamacare, the idea that you need a market-based solution is you have to acknowledge that 40 million people uninsured and everyone else going bankrupt and in, in private insurance is a disaster is a problem. Right. They don't acknowledge any of that. Right. So there's no reason for them to believe. They believe the dear leader will just wave his magic dick in the air and solve the problems or the problems simply don't exist. Well, and that so, was that was the embarrassment for Fox News at the Bernie Sanders town hall this week. I don't think Democrats should do town halls at Fox News at all. No, uh, I don't but, but Bernie, Bernie's not a Democrat. Bernie so did one. Well, I don't think anyone running to oppose Donald Trump should do a, fo- a town hall on Fox, I agree. Period. I agree. I think we mm-hmm. should boycott them. But he did. And the moment when Brett Baer asked, you know, how many of you have employer based health insurance and Bernie Sanders Uh raised his hand, you know, because he's in Congress and he has that form of health insurance and then asked how many of you would trade that for a government based Medicare type program. And everyone Mm -hmm. raised their hand and totally (laughs) embarrassed. You know, Fox News does not believe that people want to give up their precious. What is it? What's the word they used? Beloved, yeah, uh, beloved, like beloved private health insurance. Yeah. And of course, yes. anyone with a brain knows that it's the answer is to insure everybody and lower costs that way. But right. <laughs> so getting back to Leonhardt's article, the second mm-hmm. thing that he said was uh, it is very difficult to sell market-based solutions to the public. And this is ties right in with the whole, look, Medicare for All is a big, huge program that's going to benefit everybody. And right, simple. there may be a a more technocratic, in some cases, technocratic, I'm not talking about healthcare now, but in some cases when you're trying to fix a problem, it may be better to combine several agencies and do a, do a market-based thing where you include the private sector and you do different things. And 
make it a 2000 page bill like Obamacare was. And what, right. what did we find in that case? It was a huge problem to sell that to the public because it's a, it it's a big change with a complicated solution. And right. people don't want to hear, people don't have time to hear that. Most people don't have no. the education to hear about that or to figure it mm-hmm. out. And they want, nope, I get this card. I get healthcare. That's it. Well, as, I get, as I was telling Vito, as he was fixing the fridge, uh, <laughs> Vito was a nice know. guy. We, we liked Vito. Yes. No, I mean, I don't care how he fixes right. it. I care that he says, here's what's broken. I'm going to replace right. it. And you're going to get your fridge back. Right. Excellent. That's That'll really, all I, I don't want to know how, <laughs> I don't want to know how the compressor works. I don't want to know how, how its circulation works. I don't need to know any nope. of that shit. That's why we have Vito. Right. Right. Um, and, so I don't really need to know how my healthcare works. Right. I don't need to be on my sick bed negotiating in the marketplace for the Seriously. best anesthesiologist because that's the worst possible place from which to negotiate. And, and I, seriously, can we just talk about your asthma puffer for a minute? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. <laughs> Drift Cross has an a, asthma puffer. I do. I do. Tell the story of, of gives, the pricing of this thing. My, that's what gives me my, my base voice. If I don't hit that thing once a day, I, I talk like Minnie Mouse. So I don't use it for asthma. I use it for baritone. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> you use no, it no, to help no, you no, breathe. No. I do. I do pry my lungs open. And uh, uh, I, I walked to the pharmacy and and they said, uh, that'll be $50. Yeah. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, yeah. See, we're, we changed over the generic and that's $50. I said, really? And we just had a little exchange, and I I can pay either one. You know, our our well, fifty dollars was and, was what it cost to get Vito out to the house for right. to look at our fridge. So I would rather right. not we pay have, fifty dollars every time right. you need a puffer. Let me put it that way. But I'm I'm I've been I've been online at the pharmacy with with senior citizens who are negotiating yeah. about which drugs they're going to right. get. Right, right. And with poor people who are looking just freaking right. desperate. Right, they, they don't know what they're going to do because they need those that medication to live right. and they, they have no way to for it. So I consider myself an extraordinarily lucky yeah, person. Yeah. That what you that need is have this one this, thing. Yeah. 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 What about the the brand name? Oh, well, you know, we're, we switched over to generic to save you money. Right. Pass the savings right. law. Do you really? Cause the brand name was 10 bucks and they, they go and they look and they go and they look at, Oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's 10 bucks. I said, well, then why don't you just put me back on the same drug under a different name and save me 40 right. bucks. And it's like, True. yeah, yeah, that's great. Actually, I had the same thing at uh, the I, I the eyewear mm-hmm. place. I, t- I think I might have mentioned this before. The guy who was there ahead of me, the, the glasses for his son, I'm not kidding, were like $1,200. Right. And he's sitting there talking to the nice lady behind the counter going, well, why do I have vision insurance? And she's looking at him like, I don't know yeah. <laughs> because it's useless. It doesn't pay for anything. It pays to have you a, a checkup once yeah. a year. So that entire system – where you're never sure what it's going to mm-hmm. be or when it's going to mm-hmm. change and it's going to threaten your life. And it's going to, you know, it, and it's just a, a, a constant oppressive weight. I, I kind of liken it to living during the cold war. Uh-huh. You know, we uh-huh. had no idea how crippling that burden was until it wasn't a burden anymore. Right. And then we look back and go, Holy shit. It affected everything we did, yeah. where we lived, what we believed, how we, how we tax each other, what our, our agricultural policy was, because, you know, school lunches, need we need healthy kids to go off and fight in World War III. Everything about our lives was warped by this incredibly uh, oppressive, terrifying, omnipresent thing that we just didn't talk about because that's just the way the world was. Yeah. Healthcare is the same way. It is completely warping all the things we could be doing in this country yep. by constant worrying about everything. And yep. it doesn't need to be that way. Nope. It really doesn't. And guns are the same way. I I am really glad to see people uh, connecting to a statement of we don't have to live like this as the core statement of, you know, Moms Demand Action and a lot of other gun sense groups. We don't Mm -hmm. have to live like this. We really don't. Our Constitution does not demand that we live like this day to day. Let's take a lesson from 2018 Mm -hmm. when millions and millions, the Women's March, when millions and millions and millions of people turned out over and over and over again, and the Democrats took the House back. Right, right. It is not carved in stone that these racist lunatics get to run our government forever. We just have to fight really hard all the time to take it away from them and then make sure they can never, ever do it again. Right. right. Uh, but it's, it's possible. It just, it's such a fucking slog someday. And days like this, when you just look up and go, wow, 60 million people in this country are okay with this deeply racist yeah. criminal conspiracy running their country. Cause it makes liberals cry. Yep. That's how fucked up we are. That's how fucked up things are. All right. So, you know, so now we, 
take a breath and move on with the idea of claiming the narrative in the right way. So the other article in the New York Times this week that we read was, forgive me, it was about Pete Buttigieg. We do not endorse Pete Buttigieg. Who is getting too much media coverage and has been on Morning Joe too many times. We're not endorsing yes. anyone. We are going to stay deeply interested. We have a stake yeah. in this game. Yeah. Whoever the Democratic nominee is, we will support them and send them money. Well, and, and I will say this. If Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg I'm going to say Mayor Pete, if Mayor, Mayor Pete, Pete is not the nominee, which, you know, uh-huh. it, where he's polling right now, he, he if if the election was held today, he would not be the nominee. If right. he is not the nominee, the nominee would be crazy not to put him on the short list for VP. I That I yes. will say. Yes. Uh, he is like the anti-Dan Quayle. He is for those absolutely people who've been- uh, a remarkable storyteller and remarkable resume and remarkable candidate. And mm-hmm. I feel personally uh, should be one of the last white guys standing. <laughs> you know, I think there's, there is an appetite for progressive women like myself yes. for it to be a woman and to be a person of color uh, or or both or not or mm-hmm. one of the two. That's what I mean. And uh, the women who are running are doing a really good job on the campaign trail. I, we've said before that, you know, Elizabeth Warren looks younger every week and yep. uh, Kamala Harris is really nailing down the endorsements she, not mm-hmm. that that necessarily translates into votes, but she's really nailing down the endorsements. She's got an amazing staff, and uh, the way she's running in South Carolina is remarkable. So, you know, we will see how these things unfold. Uh, a lot of uh, people on Twitter, and particularly women this week, were really mad because Pete, Mayor Pete is getting an inordinate amount of yes. media attention. Too much, frankly, and, too much. Well, too much compared to the women. If, if they were going to yeah. just have 24-7, which you can't right now because right. of Mueller, but if you're going to have 24-7 campaign coverage and just continually have people on, then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, we, it might be more balanced. But since there's only so many minutes in the day when they're going to cover people and, it, and you know— literally half of those minutes at this point at, at a, one point this week were repeat uh you know that's a little bit much and i think people were upset about that but uh i just want to say that once women start winning primaries and caucuses uh that narrative is going to change right. and that will be a good thing mm-hmm. it could also be a bad thing depending on how the misogyny in the media plays out mm-hmm. i think we're ready for them and I would suggest to mainstream media voices that you tread very carefully and think and listen and announce what you're going to say off on women and women voters before you broadcast yeah. it. They're coming for you, man. They're, they're they're absolutely coming for you with yeah with knives out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. That is a good thing. We are ready. We are furious and we are ready. Yeah. There's there's a, a, a little anecdote since we're going back to the, the article and narrative about how to reframe the discussion of the Supreme Court seat. Oh, it's so it was good. a masterful, yeah. it was a masterstroke, and it was just this is what this is how storytelling is important. Yep, it's not a policy prescription. It's not you know there's no charts and graphs involved. It was a very simple way to use the opponent's own weight against yep. them. You want to tell them yeah, what well, it was? Mayor Pete said uh, changing the size of the Supreme Court was something that Republicans already did. They changed it to eight, and they changed it to eight until they could put a Republican on the court. And then they changed it back to nine. And it was Mm -hmm. a way of looking at the Merrick Garland theft Mm -hmm. as transformative and how Republicans had transformed the court by, by subtracting a seat and making it off, you know, off the table. Oh, that's right. There was eight and it was eight because they insisted that the number be changed until they could get a Republican president. That was it. And and remember John McCain was going to block, if Hillary, if Hillary Clinton, Clinton won. for another another eight years, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was never going to. So this was not. On. Yeah, right. this is the entire the entire Republican Party is corrupt from voters to elected officials to the White House. The whole party they is corrupt. And that's, they steal elections and, so, and they steal Supreme Court seats. Absolutely. And so when yeah. when you were listening, and I was listening to a podcast today or two, and I would like to tell everyone once again for the millionth time, and, and my wife has written about this extensively. They're not Trumpers. They're not those people. They're not people who are on the president's side. They're not just those shameless people. They're Republicans. 
remind everyone every time you hear in a sentence, every time someone tries to do this, every time someone tries to say Trumper right. or supporter, no, they're Republicans. These are Republicans doing Republican things. Republicans nominated this asshole. Republicans elected this asshole. Republicans put Mitch McConnell in the House and Paul Ryan or in the Senate and Paul Ryan in the House. This and Republicans are trying to steal your right to vote. Republicans are trying to fuck you out of your health care. This is what Republicans do until the Republican Party is destroyed and everyone who helped bring it to this place has to uh, pays a price for aiding and abetting this nonsense then we're going to be stuck with this so as just as a matter of controlling your own environment controlling your own narrative remind people no 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 they're not trumpers they're republicans doing what republicans have always yeah. done anyway back to the article yeah so uh pete Buttigieg is a fan of the don't think of an elephant school of political narrative uh it's george lakoff's book and that came out around the Al Gore era. Is that right? I believe it was. I think that's the, right. The George yeah. Bush first term era, 2004. Uh, and it is about creating a narrative about your campaign and uh, basing it on values. And we've talked about that before, that t- lead with your values. We all value children. So we need an edu- we need an education system that supports mm-hmm. children becoming the best educated in the world, et cetera. We all support having safety for our neighborhoods. So having a good sidewalk. And then you can start, you can glue onto that value different prescriptions for how to fix problems. But if you need to start with a shared value that we all have, we all value this, mm-hmm. we all value that. And what Pete, Mayor Pete has done in his campaign is uh, talk about security. That's one of right. his big things is security, not mm-hmm. just homeland security, not just border security, but healthcare security, cyber mm-hmm. security, and these things that are essential to people feeling safe and secure. And building off of that into po- policy prescriptions, which he admits he is light on because he is yeah. building this narrative. Uh, mm-hmm. And the article talks about John Edwards. And the the time in the debate when John Edwards was asked about his favorite movie and he went 90 <laughs> seconds without answering because he was weighing what's the political right answer what's rather right than answer? what's, what's right my answer? favorite yeah. movie. Yeah. Uh, and Mayor Pete's favorite movie is Gangs of New York, <laughs> <laughs> which he admits, you know, it's probably not going to wind up in the canon of great movies forever, but uh, mm-hmm. Because it's incredibly violent, but uh, it's one of his favorite movies. So it's a good movie. It's a good, it's a good movie. movie. <laughs> yeah, it's too long. Uh, it's a good it's movie. It's a good movie. So, so the the point I do recommend this article about Pete Buttigieg and the power of narrative, uh, because I think um, perhaps on healthcare we're already past an uh, an area of agreement where we realize Medicare for all is the direction we want to go in. And it's a matter of, Uh do we do what Bernie Sanders wants and do it in four steps? Uh, Do we do it faster, slower, you know, with, with more input from private industry or private, do we make a space for private healthcare or not? Uh, You know, those kind of discussions are going to go on. Um, But reading that article in the New York times also reminded me about how good Republicans are at narrative. And yes. particularly Grover Norquist, it, rem- it reminded me what Grover Norquist said. And I feel like we, this is a terrible thing to say, but I feel like we Democrats need to be a little more Grover Norquist in that we don't need a policy directed president. We need a president who will sign what we, what Elizabeth Warren puts in front of them. You know, what, what, yes. yeah. <laughs> what Cory Booker on race puts in front of him. And that was what Grover Norquist said about, you know, a a president of the United States who was a Republican. We just need him to sign the tax cuts. And they got that. They got Donald Trump to yep. suit somebody to sign the tax Grover cuts. Grover Norquist got exactly the president he right. wanted. Right, right. He did. He absolutely did. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't. I found it uh, disgusting and yet remarkable uh, and worthy of mention. Um, yesterday on Fox... Katie Pavlich on Fox News earned her Fox News paycheck yesterday on Thursday. Mm-hmm. That cinematic moment where Donald Trump said, I'm fucked. You know, oh, my God, this yes. is terrible. This is the end of my presidency. I'm fucked. He said that at the moment that he knew 
that he was informed that Robert Mueller was going to be a special counsel. They were going to hire a special counsel to investigate him. And he said, this is the end of my presidency. I'm fucked. And Katie Pavlich uh, earned her paycheck. And as I wrote at Crooks and Liars said, her lie was so big, it's likely the corpse of Roger Ailes sat up to salute. She said, he essentially was saying his presidency was over as a result of the special counsel getting launched, but he didn't say it in the sense that he was guilty. He said it in the sense that the special counsel investigations would slow down his agenda. <laughs> and I, I said, what agenda? Packing the courts? Yeah. Violating the Geneva Convention? Yeah. Collecting emoluments? What, what agenda are you talking about? And, you know, the agenda is whatever, whatever he wants uh, to do to hurt brown people and make money. And all of that agenda is already firmly in place. There is no threat to it at all, thanks to Mitch McConnell enabling yeah. everything he does. Oh, no. Th- we're going to be living with the with the fallout from this yeah. for decades, for decades. And and getting these people flushed out of our system uh, is the work of, the, of a lifetime of the next generation. What our job is is to stop the mm-hmm. damage, stop the the stop the poison from being dumped right. into the system. And and that's why um, I think the and, candidates who are saying uh who are focusing on uh values and finding a narrative for their own campaign are doing well. But you can understand immediately immediately why is Elizabeth Warren running for president? Why does she think she should be president? Because the system is rigged against the average American. It is rigged by big banks. It's rigged by wealthy people. And it's corrupt. The system is corrupt in Washington. And her whole campaign is about ending corruption and evening the playing field. Uh, That is also a large part borrowed from Bernie Sanders. Well, and if you'd like to know where the inspiration for this some of the inspiration for this came from. My wife sprung this on me. Uh, she said, remember that red letter media <laughs> review of the Phantom Menace? Yes. I got, oh, I love this woman. <laughs> he I, that's why I married me. this woman. <laughs> yes, I do. It was brutal. It was a brutal, it was a, like a 90 minute takedown of a two hour movie. It was, and it was years after the thing was out. And if you haven't but seen one it, of, go listen to the whole thing. Red oh, letter media on YouTube. Yeah. It's spectacular. It, it turned them from a small boutique Milwaukee a uh, couple of guys bitching about movies to a fairly large enterprise. Right. The the narrator said, okay, ask his friends. Now, tell me about Han Solo. Tell me about Luke Skywalker. Tell me about Ben Kenobi without describing their physical features or like their job description. Right. And they could do it. It was easy. Well, you know, there's a, he's a rogue with a heart of gold. He's a young hero. He's an adventurer, princess. Okay. And then he said, now in The Phantom Menace, he goes through a few characters. Describe this person. And they all started to laugh and go, He's got a beard, I think. Yeah, that's a physical it's, characteristic. It's, you, it's can you, this is totally unfair. And that there are people on Twitter who are mad at me because uh, there's this idea that somehow personalities and presentation matter in politics. Yeah. And it should just be policies. And like, well, when we live in, on that planet, I'd be happy to join you in this conversation. But I live here in this world where that shit really matters. I mean, it's how Barack Obama became president. Right. It's it presentation is enormously important. Your personality is incredibly important, um, and that's just the world you live in. So you kind of have to factor that into your thinking. And if and exactly what you said, you can tell you can tell me exactly why Elizabeth Warren is running for president in like two right. sentences. Mayor Pete, uh, it's generational. It's clearly generational. Mm-hmm. My generation is going to have to deal with the consequences of climate change far more than Donald Trump's generation. And my generation is the one to fix it. And I won't let Republicans steal faith. I won't let them define faith. Yep. And Bernie Sanders, the same way. I know why Bernie Sanders wants to be president, because he needs a revolution to change the system. And the system is corrupt. And we need to break it and start over. I get it. You know, and he's a very effective spokesman for that that point of view. So for other candidates, it's important to look at that and, and ask yourself, why are they running? Do they have a message that it, that can be boiled down into two sentences? And so may I give it give it a shot at defining it? Why should Donald Trump be impeached? Donald Trump should be impeached because he has no respect for rule of law. Yeah, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of chitter chatter on the Twitter today, including Ezra Klein, about, I think it's a mistake. And, and Rick Wilson, you know, uh, it's just going to fire up the Republican base and well, we don't want to do that. It's, uh, it's all these political considerations. Here's my two sentences. There are currently 2 million American men and women in uniform around the world putting their lives at risk defending the Constitution of the United States. What a fucking shame it would be if the United States Congress refused to do likewise. Hmm. That sounds like a Clintonian argument for impeachment. 
also. That was the argument they made it, about it, Clinton. Yes. Well, well, you know, we all these men and women are, are putting their lives at risk over in Iraq. And it, it would be it would actually you'd be shaming them. It would be embarrassing them. You'd be letting down the troops if you didn't impeach Bill Clinton. That's what they said. That's what Republicans were saying of uh, 1996, mm-hmm, 97. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what they were. I, I have it in my archives. I'm sure all the magazine articles are gone now. And <laughs> most of the blogs are dead. That I, I link to them. But that was the argument they were making. You will insult the troops if you don't impeach this son of a bitch. Right. And all I can say is, you know what? You're right. Let's use your own <laughs> logic. And of course, it's silly because Republicans don't have any sense of shame or history. They're not moral creatures. They're just little monsters or big monsters or bigots or idiots. But they're not. You can't appeal to them on that level. It simply won't work. But for making the argument to your fellow progressives or people who are more or less on your side of the aisle or say they are, who say, no, 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 you don't want to fire up the base. You don't want to make Republicans angry. If you're if your political argument against doing the right things is that well, bad people will be mad at you, then you shouldn't be in the argument business mm-hmm. <laughs> because mm-hmm. that's first of all, that's all they do. They never get tired. They're a bunch of racist wind-up toys. They never get tired of hating liberals. They never get tired of coming up with excuses for why I'm a traitor. So that's a dumb reason. And second, if it's the right thing, then you should be doing it because that's your job. And if it's if you're looking the other way because Mitch McConnell controls the Senate, well, you know, that's how we lost Merrick Garland. Right. I, th- I think this uh, let's lose until we win strategy yeah. is not working. And no. fortunately, I do think that there's enough uh, live wires in the House caucus that Nancy Pelosi has to lead that they had to back up. Steny, you know, Steny mm-hmm. came out and wanted reason. <laughs> yeah. Steny Hoyer, look, here's what we'll do. Me and Chris Matthews and Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill will sit around and drink whiskey and it'll all work out. They call that Steny. <laughs> and John Meacham will be there taking notes. Oh, this is going to be great someday. I'll write a whole fucking book about this. This is historical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Steny. Yeah. But you know what? Victory is contagious. Yes. Winning is contagious. Yeah. And and don't forget that. I mean, Republicans are currently getting their asses kicked every which way you can imagine. The only thing keeping the party afloat is the fact that Donald Trump inherited an economy that Barack Obama put back together again from the scraps that George Bush left behind. You're absolutely right. If this if we were in a recession right now, he'd be out. He'd be out. I don't don't know that. I think if there were a recession right now, he'd roll tanks in the streets. Yeah. I I don't think there's anything beyond his doing to hold on to power because once he loses power, he goes to jail. Yeah. And that's scary. That's scary. Or can never show his face in public again. Yeah. And he doesn't want to sit in Texas and draw pretty pictures of his feet in a Uh. tub like George Bush. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And his children certainly don't want that shit either. So uh, they have to hang on to power or they go – to the bad place. Mm -hmm. And this is something I heard. I can't remember where uh, I heard a fleeting bit of this. And I do believe it's true. The more I thought about it, the more I think it's true. The institutions of government of our government have already failed uh, because we're no longer a nation of institutions. Institutionalists are are wrong. We're a nation of political parties now. Mm -hmm. And one party, the democratic party believes in the idea, in the fantasy, in the, in the, in the, in the memory of democratic institutions. I would say they the ideal them fondly. of democratic institutions. I yeah, would put a rosier that's, that's, picture on it yeah. than that. Yeah. And so they, the Democrats believe in courts and laws and legislative oversight and government programs helping people and, and all that good shit that you and I agree on. Democrats believe in that. The Republicans don't believe in institutions mm-hmm. at all. They don't believe in government oversight. They, they have contempt for the rule of law. And the only time they ever trot out the idea of oversight is to beat the shit out of Democratic presidents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they don't believe in the right to vote or the sanctity of the elections. We don't have institutions anymore. Yeah, we have what, and this is complete. This is why fights are so asymmetric. Democrats are fighting to try to bring them back, and Republicans are fighting to destroy them. And it's always easier to destroy something than to than to maintain it. And and that's why attacking Fox News and hate radio doesn't work. You have to go after the people who pretend that they're defending the institutions that they they claim to love. And you have to put them on the spot wherever possible and say the only people, the only people sticking up for civil rights in this country, as sad as it fucking is, are Democrats. Mm-hmm. The only people who give a shit about holding people accountable in power are Democrats. You might not like all of them. You might not, 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 not like most of them. But the only party who's doing all the shit that you say needs to be done are Democrats. So if you're leaving the idea the Republican Party has failed and has betrayed this country, and that's because they've been working on this for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. If you're leaving that out of your narrative, you're lying by omission. And I cannot trust you if you do that. Yep. 
That's all I really want to say about well, that. And I think if you're finding fault with a Democratic candidate who has a chance to beat Trump and to mm-hmm. restore the White House to Democratic control, and you're you're picking on that and finding reasons to pick on them, uh, mm-hmm. you're with Putin. And I don't have time for that. Uh, I'm yeah. not. I will have, as I've said before, have one vote in the Illinois primary, which is after Super Tuesday. I'll be lucky if I have three candidates to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, be, really, really, really be aware. If you want, if you want to do this, this is an interesting exercise. Is to go back. There is a website that has the calendar of dropouts in the 2016 Republican primary races. And how quickly they dropped out. Some dropped out before the first primary, before Iowa. They dropped out after the first debate. They dropped out because they ran out of money. They ran out of uh, energy, you know, to do this and realize I'm not going to make it. I've done, I've been on TV. Yeah. I've raised my profile. You know, we have a lot of those kind of mm-hmm. candidates in the Republican Party. And Mike Gravel. <laughs> and think about where your primary is and you have one vote. If you're in Iowa, that's a big vote. If you're in New Hampshire or South Carolina, that's a big vote. Uh, later on, you're going you're gonna to have to figure out your choice based on who's left. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I am painfully aware yeah. that I don't get a say in this until March 18th. In some ways, that makes it easier because candidates will have dropped out and I'll have a clearer sense of, oh, I need... I have these three people to choose from. Now yeah, I'll choose. In, in Illinois, it's always a week after Easter. You're at the store looking for <laughs> Easter candy. So, you know, it's like, oh, okay. Well, jo- I like jelly beans. They're fine. They're okay. <laughs> and, you know, the, the the Reese's people are everywhere. So I never need yeah, to run out of them. No. Um, but, it, you know, this this is just the function of where we live in the system that yeah. we work uh, yep. under. So, so, and that's that's the way politics works. And, and California may have more choices than uh, mm-hmm. we do. That's a week earlier, but that's all that is, is a week earlier, yeah. and that's a hugely expensive primary. So, and That's the thing. It's all about yeah. money. It's money and, and TV right. and radio, and you, there's no way to shake enough hands in California to make right. a difference. So, and, and, and having momentum, having some sort of momentum or a, a, a narrative of winning. Yeah, yeah. a narrative. That would yes, be good. That would be, Perhaps that a narrative. Would be. We don't want to leave our discussion of the Mueller report without uh, – noticing that the Republican Party let a foreign country meddle in our elections. Yes. And they're cool with that. And they're cool with that. Yeah. And uh, that is a huge takeaway from the Mueller report. All right, let's do news roundup. Let's round this shit up. You want to take odds or evens? Odds, because I don't want to have to pronounce the name of a Kremlin spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> shit. Which I read shit. ahead and realized. I don't write these notes. I should have known. <laughs> Next week, rock, paper, scissors. Spot. Number one. Yeah. <laughs> Both the Mueller report and James Comey's sworn document that Trump ordered the illegal prosecution of his political opponents. Yeah. Yep. A Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, see? see right there? That, All right. Yeah, told reporters that M- the Mueller report contains no evidence substantiated by any facts. And Russia interfered in the 2016 election and that Moscow rejects such accusations. is scrupulous. Stay tuned. To the Glenn Greenwald and Tucker Carlson hour for more on this information. Oh, the bros. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the bros. Yeah. Mueller yeah. did not exonerate Trump. Newsflash. <laughs> yeah. Instead, he drew a roadmap for impeachment and handed that to Congress. Quote, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. Based on the facts and the applicable legal standards, however, we are unable to reach that judgment. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're in for Mullergate summer, I think. That's that's yeah, well, sure, at, at the very least. And, yeah. And Donald Trump has two takeaways from the Mueller report. One is game over, total exoneration. <laughs> and then crazy Mueller report. Don't listen to it. He also said so bullshit. Yeah, bullshit. He said bullshit. The president said bullshit. said bullshit. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh my god. And and uh, you know that the Game of Thrones people have asked Donald Trump not to use their font. Uh, yeah. On Twitter, he he did a uh, Game of Thrones style picture of himself, which people are photoshopping with handcuffs and uh, so forth. And uh, yeah. it was Stephen Colbert who said the smoke around him is is that which William Barr blew yeah. up his ass. So this week, Bill Crystal and his merry band of Bush regime dead enders took credit <laughs> for not yes. making things worse. Can you flesh out that story a little bit? Yeah. Sure, he got on Twitter and just wanted to thank him and all his because Bill Crystal's a little machine for making up committees that he gets his friends to fund, 
And it's like Republicans <laughs> for law and order. That's one of my many, many, many enterprises. I, I think we can all be proud of all of the work we did at Republicans for law and order to hold Donald Trump accountable. Like, <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you and the fucking horse you rode in on. Your hands are still bloody from the last nine disasters and wars that you pimped. And I know that everyone in the media, every single one and half of my good liberal friends want me to leave this shit alone, just like they wanted me to leave Glenn Greenwald alone about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And something tells me, I don't know, some crazy instinct tells me that the people who've been Republicans their whole fucking life and are desperate for Democrats to tell Democrats how to run their campaign to make it most efficacious for them to go back to the Republican Party are not people we should be listening to. If they want to be cannon fodder, fine. If they want to admit, yes, the Republican Party's been fucked up for my entire adult life and I contributed to it and I was responsible and I apologize. If they want to go full Chuck Colson and work in the equivalent of the prison ministry. Prison ministry would be fine. <laughs> and, and, and apologize for what they did, fine. But if they want, if they want a career handed back to them, over the broken body of the Democratic Party, which they helped destroy, and the monster they their their good work over the last fifty years helped put in the White House. Fuck you! I'm not I'm not your friend, and this is why uh, I don't get invited to parties. See, you're not behaving at the Chardonnay parties. No, no. The Justice Department briefed White House lawyers about the conclusions made in the Mueller report well before it was released, which gave Trump's legal team a head start in rebutting the report's findings. Donald Trump's mob lawyer, uh, Billy Barr, you might know him as the attorney general, initially refused to answer whether the Justice Department had given the White House a preview of those findings because he works for Donald Trump. He's Donald Trump's Roy Cohn. But Rudy Giuliani bragged that he got it two days ahead of time to Fox. And Fox didn't ask him why they do that. That wasn't good. No. The obstruction of justice portion of the report was written in the belief that a Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel opinion says that a sitting pres president cannot be indicted. Uh, Donald Trump engaged in multiple acts to obstruct and influence the investigation, but his efforts were, quote, mostly unsuccessful because his aides refused to execute his orders. Do you have something in here about Don Jr.? Well, uh, Don Jr. Uh, is, has been pronounced too stupid to prosecute. Too stupid to prosecute. <laughs> yeah. The, the upshot is Don Jr., tried to help his little Russian friends shoot America democracy in the head, but he couldn't get the safety off. So he just sat there going, I don't know what I'm doing. I want to rob the bank, but I don't know how to do it. And and apparently the Mueller people said, well, you're just too stupid to do crimes. Yeah. I, I really want to do crimes. And that, I believe, is called attempted murder. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was a crime. And as someone pointed out, um, there are a lot of people who are, in fact, developmentally disabled who are in prison right now yeah. because yeah. they don't have money and their name isn't Trump. Right. So I'm sorry. Being a fucking moron is not an excuse, Don Jr. Don Jr. should be really should be in jail right now. Yep. Trump demanded that campaign aides find Hillary Clinton's private emails. After Trump publicly asked Russia to find Clinton's emails in July 2016, Trump then privately asked individuals affiliated with his campaign to find the deleted Clinton emails. Michael Flynn told Mueller that Trump made this request repeatedly, and Flynn contacted multiple people in an effort to obtain the emails, including Peter Smith, a longtime Republican operative, and Barbara Ledine, who worked for Chuck Grassley on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and we mentioned this before. Substantiating evidence corroborates Jim Comey's recollection that Trump pressured him to let Flynn off the hook after Trump fired Jim Comey and tried to have his White House counsel fire Mueller a month later. Trump told Don McGahn twice to call Rod Rosenstein and order him to fire Mueller, saying Mueller has to go for alleged conflicts that preclude him from serving on the special counsel. McGahn refused and said he didn't want a repeat of the Saturday Night Massacre, yeah. which means in his mind, he goddamn well knew what the asshole was asking him to do was illegal and would cause a major firestorm. And was a cover-up. Again, yep. it was a cover-up. And this is just, again, this is a an absolute Google map from where we are today to impeaching the President of the United States, hands it to you on a silver platter by Bob Mueller and his team. I was impressed in the Mueller report, the parts that I've read, the number of times Trump said, and now this Russia thing is all, is behind me. Right. He did it when he fired Flynn. He did it when he fired Comey. He told the Russian ambassadors the next day that this Russia thing's over now. He told uh, Lester Holt, this Russia thing's over now. And, and he continually, and you, you see it on Twitter, now it's over, now it's over, now it's over. And mm -hmm. it's not over. <laughs> 
And now you've got Tucker Carlson say, I hope this is the last time I have to talk about Bob Mueller's report now that it's over. Yeah, no one's going to rid you of that meddlesome priest there, my friend. Uh huh. No. No, uh uh-uh. uh. White House officials who cooperated with Robert Mueller at the directions of Trump's legal team are now freaking out that the report will expose them as having cooperated with Robert Mueller at the direction of Trump's legal team. Yeah, yeah. Ty Cobb, a part-time Civil War reenactor and Donald Trump's lawyer for a while, was the one who told them, don't worry, it's cool, we're cooperating. You just yeah, go talk, it'll truth. be great. Don't, don't perjure yourself because you'll go to jail. Okay. Yeah. Little did he realize that was a mob loyalty test. <laughs> Because that's how the mob works. Uh, Paul Manafort told Rick Gates to sit tight and not plead guilty because Trump is, quote, going to take care of us. I wonder what he meant by that. Probably Mm -hmm. buy him a popsicle or something. That's called dangling a pardon. Mm -hmm. And it's part of a cover-up. Yes. Oh, really? Cover-up. Did I say Mm -hmm. cover-up already? It's a cover-up. You mentioned cover-up and dangling. It's like the worst act at the cheapest strip club in America. (laughs) It's... It's covering up and dangling. Definitely amateur night at the strip club because they're just doing cover-ups. Okay. For no explicable reason, Mueller decided not to prosecute several people connected to the Trump campaign who lied to the special counsel's office or to Congress about their contact with Russians and on other matters, including Trump Jr. and Jeff Sessions. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is there. I wonder if there is a deal, because that's pretty blatantly legal under oath. Uh, However, federal prosecutors are currently pursuing 14 other investigations that were referred out by the Mueller team. And those are covered up in the redaction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So maybe that's where they are. We don't know yet. We don't know. House Democrats have subpoenaed nine banks as part of an investigation into Trump's financial and potential money laundering tied to Russia. J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Capital One, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, and Toronto Dominion Bank. Remember, Deutsche Bank loaned Trump more than $2 billion over nearly 20 years when other banks wouldn't touch him. And the Trump administration has since waived fines for Deutsche Bank and four other multinational banks convicted of manipulating global interest rates. Yeah. That sounds like a quid pro quo. It does. It sounds like a quid pro quo to me. If I knew Latin, I'd knew what that means. Meanwhile... On the other side of the planet, North Korea and uh, Kim Jong-un, you know, Donald Trump's very, very best friend who he loves dearly like a brother, like the brother by another mother, said it test fired a new type of tactical guided weapon. Oh, just like they said they wouldn't do. They also said that, that they continued nuclear talks would be, quote, lousy if Mike Pompeo remains involved. <sighs> it's either me or Mike. It's either me or Mike. <laughs> One of us must go, Donald. And I'm pretty sure I know who that will be. I mean... Come on. Donald Trump loves him some some uh, some tyrants and some dictators, especially ones who are just nuts who have bad hair. He loves that little man, and he will do anything that little man tells him to do. So Mike Pompeo, the good people at, who are the good lords split you, farewell emergency party supplies and planners, might have a little something for you uh, in a month or two. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin plans to hire Fox News commentator and known plagiarist doctor, in quotation marks, Monica Crowley as a spokesperson. What's she a doctor in, Blue Gal? She's a doctor in plagiarism, oh, in yeah. plagiarizing her PhD thesis and other yeah. things. Yeah. Published book. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. But this week's internet kitty is a bunny. As always, on Easter weekend, once again, we welcome Bun Bun Stew. Oh, Bun Bun Stew. We love Bun Bun Stew. Along with his bunny buddy, Ricky. Bun Bun Stew and Ricky are best friends. Bun Bun Stew and Ricky asked that I mention the House Rabbit Society's Make Mine Chocolate campaign. In most Western countries, 70 to 80 percent of the rabbits sold at Easter don't reach the age of one year old. A cared for rabbit can expect to have an eight to 12 year lifespan and will require medical care from an exotics vet from time to time. It's also important to have them spayed or neutered to avoid behavioral issues like spraying or cage aggression. And people not wanting the expense of this medical care is what results in most rabbits being dumped at parks Yeah, where they do not survive. Make yours chocolate. Get a chocolate bunny this Easter and leave the bunnies for people that have the time, energy, and budget for long-term care of a pet indoor rabbit. Once again, the Internet Kitty is sponsored by our fake sponsor, Freshly Poured Cat Food. 
Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my Lord, it's freshly poured. Whether you buy pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the cat food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my Lord, it's freshly poured. You can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. We want to wish everyone a happy Easter, a meaningful Passover, and whatever other holiday you may celebrate. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And we want to thank everyone. We are reaching our 5 millionth listener this weekend. We're so excited. And Mm -hmm. uh, we have no way of knowing who that listener is. So (laughs) thank everybody for clicking play. And uh We're also looking forward to episode 500. The countdown has begun. We're at 490 this week. So Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking forward to including you in our uh, celebration of that. And as I said, in a future show, we're going to have a phone number that you can call and leave a voicemail for us. And uh, we'll be getting back to you with details about that. Mm -hmm. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. We've got PayPal, we've got Patreon, we've got postal address information. All of it is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Driftglass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties sure hope Donald Trump doesn't ask him to head up the World Bank or the Interior Department or Homeland Security or the Press Office or the Energy Department. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018.